I move around a little bit. I better back that up. <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Good? That's good. Glad to hear you talking back to me. That's great. <laughs> uh, well, it's, gl- it's great to be back. It's been a couple weeks since I've been here. Pastor Jacob did a fantastic job over the last couple weeks. Can we praise God for him? Yeah. And, and all the team that came together to do the lights and, and the sound. And as often as the case, as you start to replace things and, and upgrade things, other things happen. So we're, we're not quite there yet. We're like 99% of the way yet there. But we're praising God for the continued movement forward, at least in the AV and, and not just here in the sanctuary in another week or two. Um, we're just really thankful for all of your continued support and prayers for that. Um, Wow, it, it's just so amazing, just so amazing to actually flip a switch and the lights actually work. I don't, I don't know. I, it, maybe it's just me. <laughs> it's just me. We're, we are very blessed. Uh, and, and thanks for joining us today for the new series we're starting called Road Trip. Uh, you know, summer tends to be that time when people go on road trips and vacations. And, and you know, our family, we just got back from a road trip. Uh, we, we started off our about 10 day journey going to Holiday World, Santa Claus, Indiana. Anybody ever go there? Yep, I know a few people. And that's the first time I've ever been. It was so much fun. We we went to all the amusement park side and some of the water park side and, and I heard that we didn't go to one roller coaster. So we have to go back because there's one roller coaster that was missed. And I heard that over and over and over again. And let, let me just say that These places are called amusement parks, right? After about 10 or 12 miles and legs sore, there wasn't very much amusing about it. It was fun. It was fun. And but road trips are like that, right? And we went from Holiday World, then we drove on down through Kentucky and and Tennessee into Pigeon Forge and we, we hiked up a mountain up to a place called Laurel Falls in the Smoky Mountains there. And, and uh, it, it said it was only supposed to be 1.3 miles. Um, but my, my step counter said we did five miles. And it was like all uphill. And after we got there, it was totally worth it. It was just beautiful. But I think I was looking more forward to the trip back down the mountain than actual, the actual falls. We had a lot of fun. It was kind of rainy for a little bit, and it meant we had a lot of pool time, and we, we just had a great trip. And then even coming back, there are those little kind of side trips you take you didn't expect. Go ahead and flip the slide. This is a picture of a little side trip we took to Corbin, Kentucky, uh, the home of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And Harlan Sanders, this is where his original restaurant was. And you're all thinking it. Yes, I've been called Colonel Sanders before. Many times. Especially when I worked at KFC for four years or so in high school. And it was just so much fun to be able to take a little detour. It added a couple hours to our trip back. But it was totally worth it. It was totally worth it. Uh, You know, life is a lot like a road trip. There's a lot of twists and turns and detours and And over this series, we're really using that road trip metaphor to replace the concept of our spiritual journey. And do I have any vacation planners? You know who you are. It's okay to raise your hand. You like planning out all the details. And I know automatically if you didn't raise your hand that you're not. It's okay. It's okay. But the the reality is that even for planners, things don't always go as we intend them to go. Things don't always go just exactly as we wanted them to. Life's a lot like that. It's a lot like that. And so how do, we, how do we make it through? How do we get through this journey in life that's in front of each and every one of us? That's actually what the Apostle Paul speaks to this morning in the text we're going to look at over in Philippians chapter 3. If you want to turn there, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of context to, to what we're getting ready to look at. You see, Philippians 3, if you're, if you're familiar with the book of Philippians, you know there's a couple primary th- themes going on here. See, there was a couple people in the church that didn't quite agree. And they both, if we can read between the lines, thought they knew what was best. 
and there might have been a little infighting. I mean, I, I know that can happen in families and in businesses, but church? Two people disagreeing? I mean, come on. I mean, really? And this gets back to the Apostle Paul. And at this point in time, Paul is in a jail cell. He's either under house arrest, maybe his, his like ankle or arm physically chained to a Roman guard in a home. Uh, some scholars think he was actually in a prison cell for a while in the midst of this. Either way, he was under Roman arrest. And I almost think Paul's just like, come on, kids, can't we all just get along? It's like that moment where the, I, I heard this for the first time. I'm not touching you because Adams can't touch. I heard that over this trip. The, the I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. You know, it's, it's like Paul is like saying, come on, can't we just get along? But he doesn't leave it there. Paul points them to Christ. Doesn't just say you need to hug and get along. He says what we need to do instead. We need to have the mind of Christ. We need to grow in Christ. Christ is our goal. We need to have the forgiveness of Christ. And if those things are right, all the other stuff will fit into place. Look there at Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. This is what Paul wrote to the church. Paul said, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Right off the bat, Paul lays out this implied understanding that on any trip, any journey, the spiritual journey that we are on, we need to know where we're going. You need to know where you're going. And I think these people at the Philippian church, they had lost track of that. See, this is a struggle that we all deal with. Paul says, not that I have already obtained all of this. Paul's saying, I'm not perfect. You are not perfect. And so I'm kind of reading between the lines here in the text. These people that thought they knew what was the best, they're not perfect either. You see, sometimes the longer we're around Jesus and the longer we walk in our faith and the longer we are part of a church, we can start to struggle with this. I'm saying we, me too. We can start to think that we've kind of arrived. That we really don't sin anymore. That maybe we've kind of got it mostly figured out. And then all of a sudden somebody else comes along and they look at us and they know we're not perfect and they start letting us know and, and we start letting them know. Paul's saying, hold on a second. <laughs> hold on a second. I'm not perfect. We need to acknowledge our imperfection. So what do we need to do? Paul doesn't just leave us there. He says, but I press on to take a hold for that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. We need to press on. We need to keep going toward that destination that Christ took a hold of. What did Christ take a hold of for you? What sin did he rip from your life? Did he pay for? Did he die for? What did he take hold on for you, hold of for you? He is giving you a clear destination. 
that you're no longer stuck in this imperfect mess of a world that we live in. There is a future that you need to press on toward. And as you move forward, as you grow in Christ's likeness, as you press on, you're on the right journey. I, I go back to, oh, it's probably about four years ago now, Isaiah, our, our, our son, our, our young boy, he was probably 18 months old, something like that. And now, if, if you're doing the math, about four years ago was, was when COVID started opening up and, and um, hotels started opening, flights started opening, water parks started opening. And my wife is really good at finding vacation stuff. And all of a sudden, one day, we're exhausted from all of the extra stuff that, that we had to do in ministry. I, just kind of an oh, by the way, ministry during COVID, it might have been a screen for some people, but ministers were working like a thousand hours a week, doing a lot of stuff in the background. It was crazy. And we were exhausted. And, and my wife, Brenda, she's like, hey, I found an awesome deal at a hotel in an indoor water park in Branson. Branson, Missouri. We talked about it. It was like half off of what it would normally be. And I got to tell you, before I tell you the rest of the story, it was one of my favorite vacations we've had as a family. We go to that place, and we're like literally one of the only people in the entire complex. There was like 15 people in the entire indoor water park. It was awesome. It was a gift from God. It was just amazing. Just amazing. But we, we make our way, we lived in northern Illinois at the time, we make our way down toward Branson, and we wanted to split the trip up. And like I said, Isaiah, our youngest, was about 18 months old. As parents, when do you leave when you have a little child? Nap time. Nap time. So we took off, we left, and we knew, we planned for it, we had got a hotel on the back side of St. Louis on the west side, kind of split the trip in half. And we get there and, and we stop. I even remember going through a drive through The kids even remember this to the day. We grabbed a bag full of tacos so we didn't have to leave Isaiah in his car seat awake any longer than he had to. We're like throwing them back to the kids. We'll deal with the mess later. We'll deal with the mess later. Get to our hotel. He would not go to sleep. He was crying and he was flopping, flopping like a fish. No, I mean, it, it was, it was way worse than that. He was crying. It was hours. I, I don't even remember. We were all like zombies at this point. It was like midnight. Finally, I get him out of bed. I put my clothes on. I put him in his car seat. And anybody know what I did? Grandparents, parents? I drove around the west side of St. Louis and saw every single police officer for the next two hours. And then I parked in the hotel parking lot that I paid good money for a bed for, and I slept in our minivan while Isaiah's asleep in the back seat. It was about five o'clock in the morning, maybe six, when I finally wake up. I didn't dare take him out of his seat to take him upstairs after he'd already went to sleep. Finally, I get him up and I take him in. I basically just hand him to my wife and say, he's yours. And I just fell asleep for like two hours on the couch or on the, on the bed. But see, it would have been easy to stop right there. It would have been really easy. But like literally, it's one of my favorite vacations. And life is a lot like that. If we don't know what we're heading to, when we face those twists and turns or, or those detours, we get really tempted to just give up or give in. And we miss the prize. Paul understands this. Paul understands this very well. And he's saying this not as a family vacation or family road trip, Life is like this. We are on this spiritual journey. It's not always fun. Sometimes it's hard. Many times it's hard. Sometimes we don't know where we're going. But when we know where we are headed, when we know without a doubt that we are in Christ, following Christ, facing heavenward, 
There's nothing that can stop us. So on this road trip of life, you need to know where you're going. You need to know where you're going. And Paul doesn't leave us there. He tells us how. That's why I love Paul's letters. He doesn't just leave it kind of out there where it's, it's just hard. He doesn't just say, oh, you, you just need to keep moving forward. No, he tells us how it is we move forward. That's the next point we see, that we need to forget the past to keep moving forward. That's the whole point. We need to forget what has happened behind us. Sometimes the things in the past just cripple us, don't they? It just cripples us. Look at what Paul wrote there in verse 13. He said, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Paul's saying, I haven't arrived, people. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, and straining toward what is ahead. What's Paul saying here? That in this journey, we've got to let go of the past. We've, we've got to forget it. Not, not necessarily get rid of it from our memory and black out. But we need to stop letting it control our present and our future actions. I love the, the word Paul uses there. When he talks about forgetting what is behind, forgetting, it's, it's a wonderful phrase. In the original language, it, it literally has a positive and a negative. The negative would be the things in the past that, that hinder us. I mean, it wasn't fun sleeping in that parking lot. The positive side of things that hold us back, Have you ever had a vacation that was really good? And then all of a sudden, that's the one that all your next vacations have to live up to? And it's almost like you're let down if they don't? So forgetting the past is both the, the crummy things that happened. Maybe the places where you blew it, but it's also being careful to not let the positive things slow you down. And I've got to admit that I have said it dozens of times. Said that one phrase that you hear in church and you hear in businesses, you hear in families and at home. Oh, we've never done it that way before. But we did it like this. What are you doing? You're reliving those positive moments when things were good. And stuff happened well. But what happened back here? Sometimes that holds us back from what God wants us to do over here. Both the negative and the positive. Paul says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I'll go back to a, a, a positive side of things. My wife and I, when we were first married, we, we scrounged all of our money together, and we wanted to have a really nice honeymoon. And, and there again, she found a wonderful deal. It was, it was not too long. as a year after 9-11. <laughs> and so guess what? The costs of traveling and airfare were really low. And we ended up going to Hawaii on our vacation or on our honeymoon. It was wonderful. We ate at McDonald's and the local like corner Safeway. I mean, that, that's where our food came from in the breakfast buffet every morning. It was great food. It was beautiful. And I remember turning to my wife and saying, I don't know how we'll ever go to any place better. See, sometimes in our lives, those things can happen and those positive things in the past can hinder us from what God has in store for us in the future. And Paul knows that. Paul knows that with the Philippian church that, that they're going to experience both the bad things and the good things. And he's preparing them. He's preparing them for what's ahead. Because there's always detours. There's always twists and turns. And remember, Paul is in a prison cell here. He is experiencing 
the weight of Christian persecution. And I have to imagine that in writing this, he's trying to convey that right now, you're blessed. Maybe this is a message to us as a church. Right now, you're blessed because you can share your faith freely and openly. And and instead of focusing on what matters, on becoming more like Christ and sharing Christ to others and your heavenly calling, you're fighting with each other. Sometimes we get it backwards, don't we? When we were down on our way to Pigeon Forge... I learned a lesson about Google and Alexa and Siri. They don't always give you the best directions. I like going the shortest distance in the shortest time. Anybody like the shortest time? Now, nobody ever has accused me of driving slow, but I've heard that in America, the time on the GPS is something for us to beat. Just saying. And there was this bypass that was going to take 10 or 15 minutes off the trip. So what do you think I did? Oh, I took it. And it's raining in the Smoky Mountains. Anybody driving the mountains before? Yeah, raining, Smoky Mountains. We're coming down through Knoxville, weird side road type stuff. and, And there's this turn, and I get over in the turning lane to turn, And in unison, the peanut gallery in the truck, as we're pulling our camper, our travel trailer, they all say, there's a sign that you can't drive on this road. There's a big sign that says no no campers or travel trailers allowed. I have a line of traffic behind me. There's no way off this road. You know what my response was? Well, we have a small one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we ended up making it, but just like in life, sometimes our shortcuts end up being long cuts because we didn't take the right route to begin with. And Paul's trying to bypass that with us. He's trying to help us understand if we just have the right destination and focus, if we have that, that right goal that we are pressing toward, then we don't have to deal with all of, all of these wrong turns and these, these shortcuts that end up being long cuts. We need to press on toward that destination, is what Paul's saying. Press on, keep moving forward, keep going. And, and I, I go back to that place, Laurel Falls. Has anybody ever been there? It's actually a really popular destination in the Smoky Mountains. Seriously, once again, Google got it wrong. It said 1.3 miles from the parking lot to the falls at the top of the mountain. And like I said, it was about five miles on my step counter. And, And it's really important because when Paul is talking about pressing on toward the goal there in verse 14, Paul says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. When Paul's saying press on, part of that word that Paul is using, the pressing on, part of it is you just got to put one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward. And isn't life like that sometimes? There are some days when you wake up and there's stuff going on and you are just like, Lord, one day at a time, one step at a time, pressing on. Pressing on, walking. But I love that. I love that phrase, press on in Greek. Because it's not just the the kind of drudgery or the grit that we dig down deep to keep moving forward. That, That phrase, it means to pursue. It means to literally pursue that goal in front of us. So just like hiking up that that two and a half, three mile trail up the mountain switchbacks, and I've heard a lot of complaining. Most of it was coming from me, I'll admit. 
there was that goal that kept us from stopping. And when we got up there, it was beautiful. I, it never ceases to amaze me that all of the pictures, none of them can capture just the beauty of what you see with your own two eyes. We got up there, kids took their shoes off and put them in the pools, and we're looking down hundreds of feet at the rocks in the fall below us and 100 feet or more at the falls above us. Just beautiful. And like I said, I really pursued the parking lot afterwards downhill. It was really quick. It was a really quick trip. But that's what Paul is meaning here. He's pressing on. Sometimes it takes grit, but there's a reason you're pursuing that goal. And what does he say? It's to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. To win the prize. Here, here Paul's pulling that imagery from the athletic events. Anybody like watching those athletic events that, that are taking place right now? Olympics? This is, this is some of the same imagery that Paul is, is drawing from. Except in the Olympics, you're competing for what? Medals, right? And glory. A gold, a silver, a bronze. What's the prize for us? To win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The prize for us, the goal for us, is to be in Christ Jesus, to grow more like Christ every single day, and in doing so, attain that prize in heaven, heavenward. As I, as I read through descriptions of what heaven is going to be like in Scripture, i got to tell you, I know Hawaii won't hold a candle to heaven. <laughs> I know that an empty water park in Branson in the middle of COVID won't hold a candle to what heaven will be like. And maybe as Paul is talking and writing from that prison cell, maybe that's kind of on his mind. He knows that his time on this earth might be a little limited. And he's seeing some of the infighting with people at the church at Philippi. He's like, you've missed it. You need to become more and more like Christ. And when you do that stuff, will will just fall away. Because you start focusing heavenward. Life's kind of like a road trip, isn't it? And Paul... Basically, he's saying, forget the past. Strive toward the future. And focus on Christ. He's the one that will take you home. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful for the guidance, the direction, for the encouragement even the correction that you give to us. Lord, you know that none of us are perfect. You know that none of us have attained it yet, attained that goal. And Father, we pray that today that you would speak into our hearts and into our minds. Help us to have the mind of Christ. One that seeks unity, that seeks forgiveness that offers grace, offers love. One that's both heavenly minded and earthly good. God, we thank you for Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.